And I'm going to open up the um, questions first to the panel here. So we'll just let them go at whatever order they feel, asking questions of Dr. Peter Glick. Peter, I was wondering what your uh, thoughts are on the implications of for water consumption and management generally uh, in the global redistribution of industry. The production mechanism is leaving countries of substantial development for countries of lesser development. What does this imply for the global picture of water? Well, thank you. Um, that's, a, that's a great question. I, I did say that the United States has using a lot less water today than it used to. And on a per capita basis, we're using a lot less water than it used to. So one of the questions that often comes up is, isn't that, at least in part, the result of our water-intensive industries moving overseas? Uh, that's partly true, but not entirely. The steel example I gave is a good example. We are producing less steel in the United States than we used to, but the steel industry everywhere is more efficient. We're able to do the things we want with less water. 80% um, of the world's water, I should have said this as well, but 80% of the water that humans use goes to agriculture. Only 20% is industrial and commercial and residential, all of the other demands for water. And uh, I do believe there is a, a global redistribution of industrial production. Um, I think that is affecting the water demand of different regions. Uh, it's certainly one of the reasons why China has experienced growing water problems is their industrial production has gone up enormously. But I still believe there's enormous potential to become more efficient, to do the things we want in a sustainable way, regardless of where industrial production happens. Uh, another piece of this is that um, there are parts of the planet today that don't have enough water and, and for decades have not had enough water to grow all the food they need. Uh, not, uh, not water for basic human needs, but water for food production. Parts of the Middle East, Persian Gulf, Northern Africa, where they're very dependent on water imports, in a sense, in the food that they import. We, the United States, produce a lot of food. We export it. There's water embedded in that. This is the concept of the water footprint, or virtual water, which has been uh, a lot of, discussed a lot in the water world. So there is water traded in the goods that we produce that moves around the world, and I think that will continue to, to happen. That's one way of getting around the issue of regional scarcity. Larry, oh, thanks. Uh, Peter, I, I like your analysis of the soft path for water, and especially your remarks about the uh, water infrastructure. But in developed countries, we've put billions of dollars of investment into this permanent infrastructure that we can't throw out overnight. So we're going to have to work with it and modify it in the future. So I'm curious uh, what you think the differences will be between places where there's existing infrastructure investment and places that are rapidly developing, and whether there will be a different final place where the soft path of, for water takes those two different kinds of places. The soft path for water, in my mind, doesn't mean no infrastructure. And I, was, I, th I think I was pretty clear that, <laughs> that I do believe there are parts of the world desperately in need of new infrastructure. Um, that infrastructure, water infrastructure, brings enormous benefits to us. And we must continue to develop infrastructure and to protect it and to invest in it and to maintain it. Uh, there are places on the planet, I believe, that don't have the kind of infrastructure that we've developed. Uh, that may need a different kind of infrastructure, may need decentralized water systems rather than centralized water systems. They may need different kinds of water purification systems than we use in the United States. Frankly, we could use sometimes different kinds of water purification systems than we've used to rely on. So the soft path for water is innovative infrastructure, innovative applications of technology, as well as some of these other aspects of water that we've not dealt with in the 20th century, the, the proper use of economics and the community decision-making over water, all of the other pieces of this ecosystem protection. So I do believe there's going to be constantly, uh, there, there are going to be constant changes in technology around water. I think that's a great thing. Uh, I think there are, there are opportunities, just as there are parts of the world that will never have landline telephones. There are parts of the world that will never have centralized sewer systems. And that's not necessarily a bad thing if we understand that the point 
is clean water and adequate sanitation, not the point isn't build a centralized water system. The point is understand the goods and the services that water provides and figure out how to best provide them. First of all, uh, Peter, thanks for the talk and thanks to the Pacific Institute for that annual report on water. I think it's uh, kind of a water Bible and very accessible to the general public. So thank you for that. Thank you. I have a question about the soft path for water as well. Uh, years ago, uh, Avery Lovins argued for a soft energy yes. path uh, of renewables rather than hard paths for energy, so not an economy of extraction, mining, drilling, fossil fuels. And Margaret Mead responded to him by saying, Avery, you just don't understand men. <laughs> they will think soft is just that, soft feminine, pliable, local, community-oriented <laughs> decisions, and they will prefer to engineer a big world of their own design and control, and it'll be a hard one. What I think you talk about is the old way of thinking about water. Um, is your soft path for water catching on among the male engineers and the water managers and the <laughs> dam builders and the levy people in the Army Corps of engineers. <laughs> are there gender dimensions to soft and hard paths so that should be addressed? <laughs> well, let me say a few things about that. <laughs> First of all, I should have said this up front. I'll say it now. Um, Amory, Amory Lovins wrote a book called Soft Energy Paths in 1976, I believe it was. Uh, and I've known Amory for, th for more than 30 years, and mm -hmm. the idea of soft path really is, comes out of his work in energy. And Amory was right. His, his energy work, I think, was brilliant uh, and continues to be where the world ultimately is going to go. And Amory and I ta actually talked about writing a book on the soft path for water, and we haven't yet, but... but uh, but he's definitely, attributing the concept to him is, is appropriate. Um, I agree that, that the hard path uh, is a path of big centralized infrastructure. It's things engineers like to build, big dams. And we're still very much in that world. I don't mean to, I, I can see this positive future and I think we're going to get there, but we're not there yet. Uh, it's still much easier for water planners and managers to build a dam that serves a million people than to think about water efficiency measures and, and innovative management measures that have to deal with the behavior and the fixtures and the homes of a million people. It's a harder thing to do, and we're not trained as engineers in that way, mostly. I think the world is changing. It's getting harder and harder to build big infrastructure for water, certainly in the developed world where we've built on all the good dam sites and not some of the not so good dam sites, and for political reasons and economic reasons and environmental reasons, hard centralized big new infrastructures is, is harder to do. But I live in California at the moment, and even there where new infrastructure makes no sense it's very hard to get the traditional water planners to think about low flow toilets and efficient washing machines and drip irrigation mm. rather than finding one place more to squeeze in another big dam or, or some other way to tap another groundwater aquifer. There is a philosophical issue, there is a, a, a training issue. I don't know if it's a gender thing, but I think I made a wisecrack about men. Um, I, I do think... Mm the broader the education is about our water problems, not just in a gender sense, but in a, in a disciplinary sense, the more likely we are to move to sustainable solutions. Yeah. Uh, I was gonna ask about the uh, softer, gentler side of... Uh... Right, I got into <laughs> trouble here. <laughs> water, um, and, and you actually just probably answered my question, but um, in lots of ways we're getting uh, tax rebates or um, 
um, you know, incentives to build more energy efficient homes, and when is it going to be time to start getting incentives for double piping and things like that? Yes, I think that's a great idea, uh, especially in part because of the very close connections between energy and water. It turns out one of the cheapest ways to save energy is to save hot water. So buy a front-loading washing machine. They're, they save energy, they save water, they save detergent. You can often get a rebate from your utility. Some, I'm not sure if you can get a tax credit. You can in some states. I don't, I'm not sure if there's a federal one right now. But there are all sorts of tools, financial tools, educational tools, for convincing people to do things that are in their own self-interest, but they either don't know or they need an upfront, there's an upfront capital investment. This is a problem with irrigation. Uh, farmers can often increase their yields or reduce disease by using drip irrigation, but it's expensive to uh, come up with the upfront cost, and so tax incentives, tax credits is a, is a good tool for that. Uh, there are all sorts of tools to move along this soft path that, that I think we have not adequately explored. Well, I must uh, admit that when we went to go buy a new toilet about a year ago, the uh, plethora of uh, flushing uh, skills of the toilet, sort of, you know, yes. I was overwhelmed. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So, let me say something about that. <laughs> All of you should have low flow toilets, 1.6 gallons or less. But, like any appliance, not all toilets are, are equally good at doing what they're supposed to do. And I won't go into detail here, <laughs> but if you're interested in buying a new toilet, do, do a little bit of research. There's a test called the MAB, it's an initial MAB test. MAB, yeah. MAB, I think it is. That tests the efficiency, the effectiveness of different kinds of toilets, and all toilets are rated. So go online, buy a highly rated toilet, and you will not be sorry. I now have a 1.2 gallon per flush toilet in my home, and it's the best toilet I've ever had. <laughs> Uh, which I admit was probably far more than any of you really wanted to know. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Peter, Bismarck. Basically, I agree with your, th with your thesis. But I think, naturally, it's an American audience, so your focus is on the American water issues. But if I take the rest of the world, and you alluded to you, in one sentence in your talk, that infrastructures are necessary. So you are not really arguing hard versus soft. It's really hard and soft. Uh, for the global basis, on the global context, I would argue you need both hard options and soft options. It's not either or. So I think that's a clarification probably you'd agree with. Uh, I fully agree with you that we have to move, and in fact, I go far, I'll go farther. I think we should have moved from water supply management to water demand management. We should have moved 20 years ago in, in the United States. I'm no expert on the United States, but when I look at the figures, I do not understand why people in Nevada uses three times per capita water than Pennsylvania. I've been to Pennsylvania for a brief visit. I've been to Nevada for a brief visit. I didn't think the people in Pennsylvania stank or anything. They were having showers. <laughs> uh, but I suspect it has a great deal to do with pricing. When I go to the, anywhere in the world, I ask, do you know what is your energy bill? Everybody says it's very high. <laughs> I ask them, do you know what's your water bill? He says, water bill? I have to ask my wife. So the wife comes out and says, what's our water bill? I said, and the normal response is, I don't think we have a water bill. <laughs> so this is the problem. The water is cheap. And I strongly believe, like you, the world is not facing a water crisis. I will elaborate further. We have enough water, even in the Middle East, for, I'll go a little farther than you and say for enough water in the, even in the Middle East for domestic uses, industrial uses, they're not a problem. 
what we do have a problem, and while we expect a crisis, the business as usual is not a solution. We talk in the water field, it's not a solution, but we believe as if there is no other solution. We just continue in our incremental linear thinking, and that has to change. And one of that has to be, how do we manage demand? And that is the real problem. And I'll, just one more comment. You mentioned water is an economic good, and a social good, and an economic good. I'll go farther. Water is an economic good, social good, and above all, very much a political good. If you leave the politics out from water, economics and social issues will not be enough. But overall, I fully agree with you. Um, let me make a quick comment about Las Vegas. Uh, the reason, of course, that they use so much more water in Las Vegas than in Pennsylvania, there are two reasons. One is pricing, absolutely. We do not pay enough for our water, mostly. And in Las Vegas, they don't pay enough for their water. The other is they have nice green lawns in Pennsylvania, and they have nice green lawns in Las Vegas. <laughs> we have transplanted <clears throat> our European garden mentality to a climate that, for which it's not suited. <coughs> so in the Western United States, a lot of our water use in the home is outdoor water use, and it's a luxury. And it's a luxury in part because we don't think of water as a scarce good, and in part because we don't adequately price it. Think about the ecological value in economic terms, or even just the real economic value. Um, and so that, uh, I agree, proper water pricing uh, is key. We pay more for cable and internet connections and satellite TV and electricity, all of those things separately, than we pay for water. And which would you rather not have? And the answer better not be your cable TV. <laughs> <coughs> I wanted to go to a question from one of the audience members. Um, this audience member wants to know, what are some of the examples of small community projects that you would do for $1,000 each? Water is a very local issue. Uh, how we solve our water problems in any locale depends on the hydrology, it depends on the community. It depends on preferences. Um, one of the reasons we have failed to solve water problems, we the global community, have failed to solve water problems in many parts of, of Africa is because we've been applying the wrong models. We've been assuming that every place ought to have centralized water systems or the same kind of water systems that we have. And in the last decade or so, there's been a whole new way of thinking about working with local communities to figure out what they want and then helping them get the resources to do it. Not telling them what they want, not bringing them what they, we think they need, but working to understand what local needs are and meeting those needs. And in some places it may be uh, a community ground, a community run groundwater system. In some places it may be ensuring that every school has water supply sanitation and hygiene education so that the girls don't leave when they reach puberty. Uh, so that the girls are educated. There is, I should have said this earlier, there is an enormous gender issue around water. It's not whether or not engineers are men or women or who's making the decisions, but the, the brutal lives that many women in developing countries have because they don't have safe water and they have to walk miles and girls leave school at an early age or don't go to school because their job is to carry water. There are a lot of different kinds of solutions. And, and so the answer to that question is a complicated one. It depends on where you are it depends on what the needs are, and it depends on what the communities want. But the good news is there, there are tremendous, there's a tremendous range of technologies and management approaches and institutions that can be applied in any place at any time. And there are a lot of NGOs, some of whom are here, working on these issues around the world, from, uh, from Rotary to religious organizations to uh, NGOs that, like WaterAid in London that, that works in many parts of Africa. It's not a spider, but it's, oh, I was watching it. I got it. It's still alive. Anyway, I'll call the president if you need it. Um, this is just a quick kind of follow-up. Um, Kevin in Minneapolis has emailed us a uh, question. Given your comment on decentralizing water systems, should we all have cisterns in our basements as we did in the past? 
No, we shouldn't all, this is a key point, we shouldn't all have anything. We should all think about sustainable use of management, but the solutions are going to vary in different places. Now, in some climates, rainwater harvesting and rainwater collection systems and cisterns make enormous amounts of sense. Uh, in other climates, they don't. Where I live, it, it doesn't make that much sense because we have a very, very long dry period. We have a Mediterranean climate, and it doesn't rain for months on end, and a rainwater harvesting system w wouldn't help very much. Uh, but we are increasingly seeing rainwater harvesting systems, old traditional methods that we're learning how to apply again, uh, that are appropriate. And so, in Minneapolis, I'm not sure. I don't, I don't know the situation well enough. But, but the idea is right that we ought to be thinking about a whole new range of options rather than the narrow set of options that we applied in the past. Okay. And here's one. Um, a member of the audience wants you to give more detail on how do you would write, rewrite the Clean Water Act and the Safe Drinking Water Act. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, uh, that, that's, a, that's a great question. It's a difficult question. Uh, it gets, of course, to the issue of politics. Politics, you know, what I would like to see come out of Washington, whatever comes out of Washington, are often very different. Um, but on the Safe Drinking Water Act, very quickly, uh, the kinds of pollutants that it regulates are not... Let me rephrase it. Uh, there are new pollutants that the Safe Drinking Water Act does not regulate that ought to be regulated. Uh, we have a better understanding of what's in our water. We have a better understanding of the health implications of what's in our water, what's bad and what isn't bad, and we ought to regulate those things that, are, that need to be regulated that are not addressed by the Safe Drinking Water Act. Uh, another aspect of the Safe Drinking Water Act that needs to be addressed is technology and enforcement. We don't enforce the Safe Drinking Water Act as adequately as we need to in terms of monitoring and in terms of penalizing violations of the Safe Drinking Water Act. So I would upgrade the, the kinds of things it covers. I would upgrade technologies that it addresses. I would upgrade monitoring and enforcement. On the Clean Water Act, we've been pretty good about reducing industrial pollutants from what are called point sources. We've been far less good about addressing, far less effective at addressing what we call non-point sources. You've heard about this, this already, runoff uh, from, from farm fields with nutrients causing serious problems in the Mississippi uh, River and the Mississippi Delta. We need to get better at addressing through the Clean Water Act or some appropriate mechanism uh, the non-point problems that still remain in our waterways. Those are two quick examples. Okay, we're going to go in a completely different direction. A member of the audience wants to take advantage of having six experts sitting up here. Is there a concrete scientific consensus on climate change and related issues? Or is this just a bunch of liberal nonsense? <laughs> I think they want to vote, but... All right, you know what? We're not going to vote. I'm sorry. Because you don't vote about science. <laughs> if, if you don't believe that climate change is a real issue, it's for one of a couple of reasons. Either you haven't read the science, or you don't believe the science. And if you haven't read the science, there is plenty of really well-written, straightforward, easily digestible descriptions about the science of climate change. If you don't believe the science, there's not much I can do about that. Uh, uh, and so climate change is a real problem. Humans are changing the climate because of the emissions of greenhouse gases. That's the fact. But, having said that, there are very difficult questions about climate change that really deserve public debate. We really need to be debating what to do about it. Maybe the answer is we shouldn't do anything about it. Maybe the fear is that, okay, if I accept the science of climate change, then it's going to lead to government intervention in something, and I don't like that. That's possible. Or it's going to lead to fundamental changes in energy, and I don't, I don't like the risk of, of that. These are legitimate public debates, and that's where the debate ought to be. What do we do about climate change? We have three options. We can mitigate, we can adapt, or we can suffer. And the question is going to be, what proportion of those three things are we going to do? How much are we going to reduce greenhouse gases or not? 
What are climate changes are we going to have to adapt to no matter what? And what are going to be the consequences of climate change that we're going to have to suffer? I think that's where the debate ought to be. I think it's unanimous. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good statements. Okay. Um, please discuss the human right to water bill that is being considered in California. Um, I haven't, I'm embarrassed to say I haven't read the human right to water bill in California. Uh, uh, there is a human right to water. I think if you look at international law, and human rights law and the history of human rights law, it's very clear that there is a human right to water. Uh, in the general comment 15 that passed in 2002 by the UN, they described this in detail. General comment 15, if you want to want to read a pretty good description of it. Um, what the human right to water means in terms of rights and responsibilities is a more difficult question. Uh, it doesn't mean water should be provided to everyone for free. It does mean that countries can't deny people water for political purposes. It does mean at the country level that countries need to be moving to progressively meet basic human needs for water. But there, there are questions about how to apply the human right to water. I'm not sure what it means in California. Um, I would have to read the bill. We, 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 um, we have good bills and we have strange bills sometimes. So, so this could be a great one, but, but I don't know. Um, it certainly shouldn't mean that water should be provided for free to everyone. Uh, it should mean, perhaps, that we should be better about protecting water quantity and water availability for some of the poorer populations in California. That even in California, a place that's pretty rich, doesn't have safe water for everyone. Okay, and I want to wrap up with one last question, bring it home for the education folks here. Why do you think it is that basic lessons about where household water comes from and where household wastewater goes are not built into our primary and secondary educational curriculum? That's a great question. Um, my wife works in helping elementary school teachers teach science. And uh, part of the problem is that science is a lonely stepchild in our schools. Um, elementary school teachers who have one of the most important jobs on the planet no, they have to teach writing, and they have to teach reading, and they have to teach some social studies and history. They have to teach science, and often they're not trained in science, they're afraid of science, they don't have the resources for teaching science. Um, so science education in general suffers in our schools, and it ought to be improved enormously. Uh, I think every kid, every, every grown-up, ought to go visit their water treatment plant. Um, I think they're great places. Kids ought to know where their water comes from and where it goes. Kids, kids get it. Kids are naturally curious and uh, the more... I, I, let me give you a good example of this. I'm asked... I, I, we've done a lot of work at the Institute on water use efficiency, on how to do things more efficiently with water, and I get asked by kids all the time, should I turn off the tap when I'm brushing my teeth? And I sort of thought, oh, how quaint. You know, what a, that, that's great, they really want to contribute. And a few weeks ago, after being asked this question for the umpteenth time, I sat down and I calculated how much water would be saved in the United States if we, turned off, we all turned off the water when we brushed our teeth. This number may not mean anything to you, but it's more than 500 billion gallons of water a year. It's a lot of water. In California, well, no, I'll just leave it at that. It's a lot of water. So the truth is, the kids get it. And the more we can do to educate them about water and help them learn about water, I think the better off we'll all be. Okay.